want to know how professional financial advisors are structuring their clients' investment portfolios in 2024? Today, we'll pick the brain of Andrew Altfest, president of Altfest Personal Wealth Management, to find out how he's positioning his clients' portfolios. From the risk Andrew sees to portfolios in 2024 and how to protect against them, to which parts of the stock market are reasonably priced, from which international markets look attractive, to what Altfest is doing with bonds and private equity opportunities, this is the video for you, physicians, if you're interested in improving your portfolios. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for being with us today on Wealth Matters for Physicians. It's my pleasure. Excellent, excellent. Well, today we're discussing how Altfest Personal Wealth Management is currently positioning its client portfolios. So to start us off, how did Altfest portfolios start off the year in 2023? Yeah, let's, let's go back in time uh, a little bit. Uh, when we entered 2023, there was a lot more uncertainty uh, than there is today about the economy. And there are a lot more questions about whether we're heading into recession. Um, there was some negative indicators, uh, such as an, inver an inverted yield curve, which actually still exists today. Um, and also there is uh, some slowdown in other parts of the economy, like in manufacturing. So there are these questions that we had about whether we were heading to recession. So we were more defensively positioned, mm -hmm. um, defensively positioned by not having um, exposure to some cyclical industries. Cyclical means that these industries are more sensitive to the economy. Mm -hmm. And so we were avoiding certain industries like banking. Um, and instead we were highlighting industries that were more defensive in nature, mm -hmm. in which their businesses tended to perform well, um, even if the economy wasn't performing well. And we had some positions that uh, in the portfolio, very interesting positions, because um, they allowed us to get upside capture, mm -hmm. um, move up when the stock market moves up, but then also reduce risk on the downside. And so they capped the exposure on the upside, right. called hedge positions. Right. Um, so you get, you get a good amount of upside exposure, but it's capped. And then on the downside, it's protected on the downside. So we had um, some of those positions heading into 2023. Now, as the year uh, unfolded and we got more um, conviction and more clarity around the, the economy, mm -hmm. we started to um, change our positioning and we started to actually buy cyclical investments. We reduced those hedge positions and by the end of the year, um, we, our portfolios um, were more aggressively positioned and we were able to take advantage of the, the rally and benefit from the rally that happened right at the end of the year. Thank you very much. Very interesting. So Andrew, what sectors or industries were particularly attractive in 2023? The, the Fed punished with its, uh, with its influence and its policy actions, the Fed punished certain industries mm -hmm. and those uh, by increasing interest rates. And so those industries that were beaten down last year included um, publicly traded real estate stocks, biotech companies, um, infrastructure investments. These companies were beaten down because uh, they tend not to perform as well um, when interest rates have moved up. And what we thought was interest rates only needed to stabilize for these companies to become attractive. And not only did, did interest rates uh, stabilize, um, they actually declined at the end of last year. There was a significant decline in um, the 10-year yield and long-term treasuries. And now there's an expectation that interest rates are going to act, the Fed is actually going to reduce interest rates this year. Right, right. So those um, investments really benefited at the end of last year, including banking and uh, banks which, which had performed poorly. Um, there was a regional banking crisis sure. um, that uh, we experienced last year in which um, some large companies like First Republic Bank, Silicon Valley Bank actually became worthless. Right. And so those companies, um, uh, the banking sector was depressed um, and when interest rates moved down, then those uh, banking, uh, the banking sector actually um, recovered nicely. And so our banking position um, helped um, us to, to capture a lot of that upside at the end of last year. Right, so that's really interesting. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about this, this type of work is that things are constantly changing. So you cannot just 
even if you have the best ideas in January, you can't just set it and forget it right. and put it on a shelf. And that's why it really makes sense to have investment professionals who are looking at this 24 hours a day and making tweaks as necessary. Yeah, the, the, market's, the market's changing. Um, the prices of investments are changing. Um, outlook is changing. So yeah, you have to be, it's, a, it, it's what we, these investments are examples of tactical investments. Mm -hmm. Investments where you need to be opportunistic and last year we were opportunistic, and you know some of these investments you're you're dating, mm -hmm. some you're married to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if you're dating an investment, then you have to be um, very opportunistic, and um, that that position is going to change with the environment, is going to change with the pricing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, Andrew, that was a great kind of backdrop in terms of 2023 and what was going on um, in 2024. What do you see as uh, risks, if any, to portfolios in 2024, and how might Altfest, if they're aware of these potential risks, start to protect against them? Yeah, so the, the risks that we see, the, the biggest risks are inflation actually not being under control. Mm -hmm. There's now a, an expectation in the markets that inflation has been tamed. Mm -hmm. And so inflation is, has come down, uh, still high though, um, mm -hmm. historically speaking. And so if inflation were to actually be higher than expected, and then then and then there's a, the market participants feel will feel that the Fed is going to have to be um, less um, flexible, less accommodative, right. and more aggressive in its policy decisions. Then we think that the stock market is going to sell off and get killed. Actually, um, so. That is one of the big risks that we have to think about today. And while it's not our expectation that inflation is not under control, um, it's a risk that we think about. And there's certain investments that we have in, in the portfolio today, um, which are in the alternative category, mm -hmm. that help us reduce this risk. Because these investments do well and have historically done well in higher inflationary periods. And so examples of these investments are infrastructure investments. Mm -hmm. um, these are companies that, um, whose sh prices actually go can go up. The prices of their businesses actually go up with inflation. They're, they can be highly regulated, and the regulators allow them to pass on price increases to their customers based on the rate of inflation. Um, real estate investments. Real estate investments is another example. Real right. estate has historically been a good inflation hedge. And so we keep alternatives like these in the portfolio um, to help us manage it and protect against that risk. Now, the second risk that we have today is of a hard landing. And the, the market is somewhat euphoric at the moment and is expecting that the economy is going to slow down but not be in a recession. Well, if we do enter a recession, then we expect stocks will decline and what we think will protect us in that scenario is our bond allocation. And in our bond allocation, we've increased our interest rate exposure, maturity of the bonds that we own. Right. Bonds tend to do well in a particularly plain vanilla bonds, like bonds issued by the US government, tend to do well when um, interest rates go down and when we're in, in periods like when we're in a recession. And so, um, people flock to safety mm -hmm. and buy bonds like these uh, and uh, sell their equities when there is a recession. And so we are owning longer term um, bonds than we have in the past. Um, we, like the, we like their yields today. They're historically high, so you're getting a good, nice, healthy um, yield. And, and, and in some parts of the bond market, you can get yields that are closer to uh, the historical returns of stocks. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting time to be investing in bonds. It hasn't been that way um, in a long time. A long time. And so we're emphasizing uh, these types of bonds to help protect uh, and against the a recession, a hard landing and recession risk. Thank you very much. Just wanted to take a few seconds to thank you for watching Wealth Matters for Physicians, the channel brought to you by Altfest Personal Wealth Management that provides physicians with key investing and personal financial planning strategies. For 40 years, physicians have relied on Altfest to help them achieve the financial independence and the future that they deserve. We are always honored to help you. Now back to our interview. So Andrew, 
going on right now, and right now we're filming in you know, late January of 2024, what is going on in the U.S. stock market right now? How, what's, what's kind of the, the, the mojo? What, what, are the, what are the key things, the drivers? What are your thoughts on the U.S. stock market right now? Yeah, well, this U.S. stock market is very interesting, and we have a slide here um, that uh, you can look at that shows what's going on. Um, what you see here on this slide is that the stock market is priced slightly high, historically high, at about a 19 times PE. And a 19 times PE is a little bit higher than, it, than, its, than its own history. Now, but if you look underneath the 500 largest stocks that are in the stock market that uh, is also known as the S&P 500, there are 10 stocks of those 500 stocks that are priced very high. Mm -hmm. And you'll see a, a 27, about a 27 PE. That's really high in terms of valuation. Yes. And if you strip out those 10 stocks, you have a stock market valuation of about 17, which is much more reasonable. So the 490 of the 500 stocks um, the majority of, of the, the S&P 500 uh, are reasonably priced. But there are 10 stocks that are priced very high. Now, those stocks are um, also include the Magnificent Seven, right. as they've uh, been uh, known uh, as recently. Um, and those stocks are Meta, Facebook, Google, Alphabet, um, Amazon, um, Apple, NVIDIA, Microsoft and Tesla. Right. Now, these companies um, have done very well recently in 2023. Um, in 2022, they led the markets down. And so we don't like all of those, all, the whole Magnificent Seven. There's some that we're, we wouldn't touch uh, completely. And there, there are a few that we do um, invest in that we like their long-term prospects, but there's some whose prices have really gotten ahead of their um, earnings potential and some that are facing competition um, when you get to know their businesses better. So we are um, underweight as a whole, the Magnificent Seven, mm -hmm. and instead of investing in other parts of the market um, where we're finding better opportunities. Well, that's a great segue into my next question, which is what areas of the market in the stock market right now do you think are reasonably, are reasonably priced, which present good opportunities to invest? Yeah, so we like healthcare today. Healthcare. Uh, has good long-term growth prospects, and the valuations in healthcare are more reasonable. Uh, we like publicly traded real estate. Publicly traded real estate stocks are selling at a discount um, compared to private real estate. And there's some industries, some subparts of the real estate market that we don't want to invest in, like commercial office properties. Sure. Um, but then there are other parts of the real estate market that we think are attractive. And we like uh, infrastructure investments as well. Mm -hmm. We like banks. So there are um, opportunities in the domestic markets, and that's where we're emphasizing today. Thank you very much. So Andrew, got some great information from on domestic stocks. So I think our physicians are already happy, but we're going to double down and we're going to go to even more. What, you know, what's your perspective on international stocks right now? Are there attractive opportunities on the international side of stocks? We think so, uh, and we have a, a slide that you can take a look, and I think you'll, you'll see, I think it speaks for itself. So international stocks are selling at a very large discount to U.S. stocks, um, and they all, historically they've sold at a discount to U.S. stocks, so some discount is normal, right. but they're selling at a massive discount to historical uh, averages today compared to you know, where they have sold to U.S. stocks, and this represents an opportunity. So you can get a um, competitor to, uh, you can, these are large, uh, if you look at a, a large global competitors to um, U.S. companies, mm -hmm. um, you can get these, just because based on where they're located, these companies are selling at a historical discount. And so we are overweight to international stocks and in portfolios today. Um, we typically have a 25% a allocation, all else being equal, 25% allocation to international stocks of the amount that we have in, um, in, um, in, in stocks in general. in general. About 25% are abroad. Mm -hmm. uh, today we have 
more like 40%. Wow, big difference. Big yes, difference. so 40% of the amount of, of the stocks that we have in, uh, in portfolios are outside the US. And importantly, they are in developing markets. Now, this, that might sound like a large uh, number. 25% could sound like a, a large number. Mm -hmm. um, but on a, just on a um, diversification basis, even if we, we you know, look beyond a starting point today, do you want to own international stocks because they're more attractively priced? Um, or if looking beyond that, international stocks, as you see here on this chart, have a diversification benefit. And in, uh, over, if you look historically, going back to the 70s, a good percentage of the time, international stocks have outperformed U.S. stocks. And when U.S. stocks have been weak in performance, as you see here, mm -hmm. international stocks have almost always done better. So that's the benefit of diversification and buying, um, diversifying parts of your portfolio and shopping abroad and not just in the U.S. when it comes to your stock portfolio. Right, I mean, this slide really, really drives the point home. I mean, depending on how the U.S. stock market is doing, you can see how the international stock market is doing, and if you're playing the odds over long periods of time, it can really help you to make a good investment decision. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, talking also about international stocks, and you were talking about emerging markets and so on, and uh, I'm sure some countries you're finding more attractive than others, and uh, it also depends on valuation. So can you tell us some of the countries that you find attractive on a valuation basis versus ones that you think are maybe overpriced that we should steer clear of, at least for the, the current situation? Yeah, so the, if you're looking abroad, there are actually a number of company, uh, countries um, whose stock markets are selling at a discount to how they have, uh, where they have sold in the past, again, going by the P-E ratio. And so a number of these uh, countries are in developing markets. And so developing mar some of the developing markets where we think it's good to, to go hunt uh, today uh, for opportunities um, include China, which is selling at a very large uh, historical discount um, with a single digit PE ratio. Mm -hmm. um, Brazil, uh, which is also selling at a large discount. Brazil was a, a fantastic performing uh, market last year. And, and so there are these, these markets, um, uh, like developing markets that are um, selling at a, a large discount. Now there, there's some um, developed markets that are um, priced more expensively to where they um, have been um, and I gave the U.S. as, as one example. The sure. U.S., as you can see here, is priced um, a little higher than it has been historically. We took a deeper look at that, and uh, uh, a good part of that has come down to the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500. Um, but yes, there are better opportunities on a valuation basis, and a, um, better bargains to be had in some of these developing markets. Exactly, exactly. So just because international is good, it's not like that. Not every neighborhood is good. Certain neighborhoods are currently good now, and they might change in the future. So you always, again, have to be constantly reevaluating the process. That's right. Sounds good. Thank you. So, Andrew, keeping on in our talk about international things, you know, what's going on in China right now? You're, you're seeing China in the news all the time. Something's good, something's not good. The economy, you know, what, what do we think about China right now? What's going on there? Yeah, we have a, a different point of view about China, and I think it's really important to cut through the noise. Mm -hmm. And um, it, sometimes it's good to be a contrarian investor as well. So what is happening in China? Well, Chinese growth is still pretty positive, pretty mm -hmm. strong. Mm -hmm. um, and it's come down. Its growth rate uh, of its economy isn't as high as it was um, 10 years ago. But its growth is still quite positive, and its consumption uh, growth is still positive as well. So the, consumer, the Chinese consumer is still spending money. Now, if you look at where the money is being spent, um, there is uh, spent on, on retail sales is pretty good. Um, property investments, property mm -hmm. consumption has come down, and that's where China is having some trouble is in its property sector. Right. But overall, consumption is still positive. And so if you, you have to, if you look at things overall, the economy in China is not all that bad. And that is uh, an interesting, um, uh, it's an interesting observation compared to what 
you might be reading about in the news right. about what's going on in China, um, the growth is still there. Right. I think it's like about, I said like per the slide, about like 5.2 percent, which yeah. is very, I mean, many developed countries would die for, you know, a nice growth rate like that. Right. Excellent. So following up, um, and you already alluded to this in the previous question, but what's going on with the Chinese consumer right now? Because people are saying, well, the property sector, you know, people aren't buying real estate anymore. That's where traditionally a lot of Chinese people would park their wealth or think that that would be an engine for growth. Now they're a little scared off like that because there's a lot of the big property companies have taken on a lot of debt. So what is our sense of how the Chinese consumer is doing right now? Well, it, it, just looking at the health of the Chinese consumer, mm -hmm. it's quite strong. Um, if you look at this uh, slide here and this chart on the left, you'll see that the um, deposits um, for the Chinese consumer have increased significantly. So the amount that they have deposited has increased and the amount that they're borrowing has decreased. So that really augurs well for future consumption because the, the balance sheet of the Chinese consumer is strong. Um, you could, things are, are different when it comes to U.S. consumers. Um, mm -hmm. There's more stretched people who are borrowing and you're starting to see some more delinquencies on credit cards. Um, but the Chinese consumer is, is not doing that badly. Now, if you look at, there's a really interesting uh, chart here that you see on the right Importantly, the price of Chinese stocks today is quite attractive compared to where it's been um, in the past. And you're able, I, we think that the, the worst case scenario is already priced in. The dire scenario is priced into stocks today. And it's not that everything is so rosy in China. There's, sure. there's some you know, more um, negative consumer sentiment. There's higher unemployment. Um, so there are some things that population growth has uh, come down significantly. So there are some things that, that China is working through, um, but it's already priced into the markets. And we think that over time, the, uh, the, uh, these stocks are going to be priced better than they are today. And if the Chinese government uh, becomes more supportive and, be and increases its stimulus, um, and provides more support to the economy, we think that the realization of that return could come even faster. You take a look at a company like Alibaba. Alibaba today is selling at a, uh, about 100, its market capitalization is about 180 billion. It has around $80 billion of cash, just on its balance sheet is, uh, is cash. That's phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, 80 of 180. Right. Unbelievable. So you have 20, and you have $25 billion of free cash flow that Alibaba is generating every year. Um, and it's, it, other people have, it's good to also follow insider purchases. Insider purchases are the, the people who are, um, could be running, the people running the company who, and seeing what they're doing with their stock decisions. Are they making purchases? Are they uh, making sales? Mm -hmm. um, the founders of Alibaba in the fourth quarter of last year increase their position, their own investment in Alibaba by hundreds of millions of dollars. Wow. So um, they might know uh, something that the market doesn't know. And that, it's always good to see, to, get, uh, to see support of stocks by people who are very well informed. So we think that, that the Chinese market has opportunities like this. And we think that the bad news about the Chinese economy is already priced in. So we do have an allocation to um, Chinese stocks, and we'll see if it's a, you know, how long it takes to realize um, our return in the markets. Is it going to be shorter or longer? Thank you very much. Very interesting. Very interesting. Something we're going to have to follow very closely. Yes. So Andrew, changing course a little bit, you've already touched on this a little bit in terms of bonds. Um, but if you could extrapolate a little further, put a little bit more meat on the bone, what are we doing in the bond um, area right now, the bond uh, you know, environment, that we, in order to position our bonds as best as possible for our physician client portfolios? Yeah, so bonds today are much more interesting than, than they have been because the, the, their income, the income that they uh, generate is much higher. And, uh, but we don't like every part of the bond market. Mm -hmm. And so there's some bonds that we're avoiding. 
and those include bonds issued by corporations. Corporations in the U.S. Bond, those are even high credit quality corporations, and and, and especially bonds of lower uh, credit quality, um, bonds that are junk rated, more likely to default. Right. Now, the reason that we're avoiding those bonds is because, and you'll see here on this chart, that a lot of bonds are going to mature over the next few years, between now and 2030, um, and. The, the, it's interesting to keep track of this and, and, and take note of it because a lot of corporations issued bonds in an environment uh, a few years ago in which yields were much lower. So the cost of their debt was much lower. Now they have to refinance and potentially refinance at a period in which um, it, it, yields are much higher as they are today. Right. And so there are corporations that were able to survive um, and were of lower credit quality and were able to survive in part because they could issue debt at such low levels of interest. Now, um, going into the future, they might have to deal with issuing debt at much higher levels of interest, which could be a, a very large drain on their cash flow and make it much more uh, difficult for them to, to, ca to carry forward. So we are already seeing an increase in the number of corporations defaulting. As you can see here, there's a, on the bottom right, there's a slight uh, uptick in the number of corporations that have been defaulting. And we're not getting paid, you're not getting paid much more um, to own corporate, to debt of corporations. Okay. Um, there, there isn't a, a, a great uh, pitch and, and buying opportunity where you're getting a lot of extra yield. Okay. So we're looking forward to potentially buying uh, this debt um, one, if it sells off, right, as we think it, it um, quite possibly will in the future. Um, instead, we're buying debt of the U.S. government, so um, U.S. government bonds. We're buying some Treasury inflation protected securities, um, bonds whose uh, prices, um, the amount that you get back, adjust with the rate of inflation. Mm -hmm. And then you also get some um, interest on top of that. And then we're buying bonds uh, tied to the housing market. So these are bonds tied to mortgages, getting pools of mortgages that are backed by real estate. And these bonds are selling at um, historically attractive prices. People haven't wanted to buy these bonds as much because there isn't as much refinancing activity uh, right. today as, uh, because a lot of people have mortgages that right. are, whose interest rates are quite um, below the current mortgage rate. Correct. So there isn't as much refinancing today, but their prices reflect very high yields. And so you're getting, um, at the end of last year, we were buying these bonds with yields um, that were very close to 10%. And who's, and meanwhile, their risk levels, we didn't think, we don't think are very high um, because they are, their loans are secured by um, real estate at a very, conservative level. And so we, we are buying um, um, bonds tied to the housing market. We also own some bonds tied to the, um, the banking sector and who that became those bonds became attractive um, once the uh, once banks sold off heavily during the regional banking crisis in the first part of last year we continue we bought those bonds in the middle of the year and continue to hold those bonds. And, uh, and so those are parts of the bond market that we like. Um, at the, the municipal bond market, especially when we're talking about allocating bonds to a physician's portfolio, um, a lot of our physician clients are in higher tax brackets so, um, and live in, in states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, um, Pennsylvania, in which um, tax rates are, you know, take a uh, additional, state tax rates take an additional bite out of their wallets. So we, we like shopping in the, in the municipal tax-free bond market. The opportunities there, they're not always great opportunities there. We have to be opportunistic, going back to our, our you know, first part of our conversation. Right. You have to be opportunistic. Um, most of last year, the municipal tax-free bond market was not compelling to us compared to taxable bonds. A lot of their tax benefits were already priced into the bonds. At the end of last year, though, there, there was this great buying opportunity. Um, and in November, we were buying millions of dollars of these bonds. 
and we actually change our whole bond process. Um, we usually rely on bond brokers who know exactly, municipal bond brokers who know exactly what we like and what we're looking for and to bring us these deals for our clients. Um, we bypassed them at the end of last year we just, because we had such supply um, that we wanted, such uh, demand and opportunities to purchase these bonds that we went beyond them and we just went out and bought these bonds directly and millions of dollars of these bonds. And we had, within a, a few days, uh, often with these bonds that we were buying, there was a, a, an increase in price. So you buy these bonds, we're buying bonds at, you know, in one example is buying triple tax free bonds, triple A rated, so very safe, very high safe. credit quality mm -hmm. bonds at a 4%, 4.6% yield to maturity, and also a four plus percent yield to call. And that's what you expect to, to get with these bonds over a over the uh, duration of, of the purchase. Correct. Um, in a very short amount of time, these bonds moved up in price significantly. And so we were buying bonds that 105 price, they moved up to 115 in, in some cases. And we um, the average uh, return of these bonds since purchase, um, since we last ran the, the performance a few days ago, was a six percent return since purchase in just uh, uh, in just a couple of months. Wow. So that's not that's a, a very healthy return for two months. Six percent on on very high credit quality um, bonds that are supposed to be uh, more plain vanilla. Now four point six percent. That's a really good yield if you're in a very High tax bracket. Uh, high tax bracket, and you adjust that yield, you can have a yield is, uh, of over 9%. That's the equivalent of having a bond that's yielding 9 plus percent right. when you adjust for its tax benefits. Mm -hmm. And so this is, that's a, a triple, ta triple A rated bond, triple tax free, that is yield, that is giving you a return that could be closer to stocks, stock like return. So we were, we were buying uh, a lot of these bonds. Unfortunately, that, that opportunity doesn't exist uh, as much today. We're still buying bonds, tax-free bonds selectively, but we're opportunistic in the tax-free bond market. There's um, always, hist if history um, repeats, which we think it will, there'll be another good buying opportunity that we'll be looking for for our clients. That's amazing. It's just this theme is just going throughout our entire conversation is that, you know, you have to be, do your research, do your homework, but then you kind of just like, you just have to wait, wait, wait until, it's not like that there are great opportunities just lying around for months and months on end and you can scoop them up this month or you can wait till next month. You really have to jump on them when they're available because they might be gone very, very quickly. Right. So that's one of the good things uh, about our physician clients who work with Altfest is that we're doing this day in and day out as our full-time job. And so you can't really dabble in municipal bonds, right? You can't really dabble in international stocks. I mean, you can, but then you run the risk of getting hurt. But if you are watching the markets constantly and have a very good sense of the valuation so that when something becomes more attractive, you can pounce on it before, and usually when there's a great opportunity, it doesn't last very long. Right. So it's very, it's very, I think this discussion is really helpful because it really shows that if you dabble in something, you know, you're not going to become an expert and you really need an expert to really kind of navigate for you who's spending 24 hours a day on this. Yeah, we think so. And we, we have um, someone who's dedicated to tax-free bonds and different people who cover different parts of the market. And, you know, as, as the saying goes, you want to be greedy when others are fearful. Right. And I think that holds true when it comes to the tax-free bond market and and some tax, tactical investments in general. Excellent, excellent. So last question that we have for today's discussion, which I found extremely interesting is, and I think physicians are gonna like this question too, is what do you think about you know, the uh, you know, private investments, you know, private equity, things like that? I know that this is something that you know, it's not really in the mainstream financial news, it's all bonds, stocks, bonds, stocks, which is very, very important. But what do you think about private equity opportunities? Or, or, yeah. or it could be private debt opportunities. There, there are some. Um, we don't like every uh, private equity investment. Sure. Um, there are many that we don't like. Um, but as we look at different opportunities today, there's some in the private equity space, and we're taking a very close look at 
and some were already um, offering to our clients. And so the private investments that are attractive today, um, some of them are uh, very much related to broader themes that we're seeing. So if we like bonds today, we think bonds are interesting, historically higher yields, they have a good role in portfolios, they could be um, a hedge against a, a recession. Mm -hmm. um, the, if you look at um, part, private investments that are tied to the bond markets, you'll see private debt. And private debt, there are a lot of uh, lenders have pulled out of um, traditional loans. And the, they've been replaced by private lenders. And those private lenders um, have stepped in, except they charge, they can charge an arm and a leg. Arm and a leg um, means that they're, the income that you receive as an investor in these private loans is, it can be very juicy. And we're finding um, income above loans that are offering yields north of 10%. Now, what are you investing in? The, the um, quality of their credit, they've tightened their lending standards more recently. And so we think that the risk of these loans is actually not that high. And meanwhile, the yield is quite healthy, quite juicy. So we are looking very closely at private loans in the private loan space um, as a good buying opportunity. Um, when it comes to, um, I mentioned we're avoiding um, debt issued by corporations, but we are carefully looking at um, the distressed debt market. Distress has already increased. Um, Distress means companies that are near or in default, mm -hmm. and there can be good opportunities to invest in their loans after they have defaulted and participate in reorganizations. Um, and so we're looking at uh, funds um, getting ready for the next opportunity to um, invest in distressed debt um, as there are the, there is this, um, the next few years, there's gonna be maturities um, of these uh, of bonds issued by corporations, and I, we think that that could very well increase the level of distress and therefore buying opportunities. Um, there's some uh, investments tied to uh, to the Chinese uh, um, bond market as well, mm -hmm. and some that are tied to uh, property developers whose debt is selling at a very significant, uh, very 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 large discount. And therefore, we think that they're representing an attractive buying opportunity because they could be um, reorganized and have actually have been reorganized and, and whose value could be much higher after the reorganization that the Chinese government has decided to support the property sector because it is uh, vital to the health of its economy. Um, we also have an in-house real estate fund and these are all investments that are, are for accredited investors. Right. So you have to um, meet those qualifications. Um, but we have an in-house real estate fund, an in-house real estate strategy that we offer to our clients that is uh, still open um, that uh, we like very much. And, uh, and then there's some more investments uh, beyond that that are, that are interesting. So just in the interest of time, I, I won't go through every, every single investment, but as you can see, there's some very interesting uh, investments today that we are looking at very closely for our clients. Well, perhaps that will be a topic for another episode of Wealth Matters for Physicians. Uh, yeah, we could have a whole session just on this. Exactly, exactly. Well, you know, this is wrapping up, this is wrapping up the end of today's discussion on how Altfest Personal Wealth Management is professionally positioning our clients' portfolios. So I just wanted to say, Andrew, you know, thank you so much for being on Wealth Matters for sure. Physicians. Um, we greatly appreciate it, and I think you've given our physician audience a lot of practical, useful information that they can use right now to help better their portfolios going forward. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was fun. Thank you very much. So, Thank you for having me on. Pleasure. If you'd like to discuss the information explained in today's video, receive a complimentary review of your investment portfolio, or a retirement readiness analysis, or discuss any other personal financial planning area with an Altfest professional at no obligation, please contact my colleague Jesse Freeling at 212-796-8732 or by emailing Jesse at his email address, which is also in the description of today's video. If you like today's video, 
please click the subscribe button below and hit the bell icon to receive notifications each time we release a new one. If you think that a fellow physician would find this video either helpful or interesting, please feel free to share it with him or her to help them strengthen their finances. Lastly, as always, if you have topics you'd like us to cover, have certain questions or dislike certain things that we're doing, or have any other feedback, we'd love to hear from you so we can make this content even better and more relevant to your lives. So please give us your comments in the comments section below. Well, that's all for now, physicians. Thank you very, very much for being with us in today's video, and I look forward to being with you in our next one. Until then, be well, and remember to keep on optimizing your finances, or let us help you if you'd like.